It is 1972, and the world seems to be turning away from James Bond. The 60s are over, and Sean Connery has left the role of 007. Many critics say James Bond is dead. Welcome to the story of the film that proves them wrong. So the problem was going to be a new Bond, and then it was obviously the biggest part that had not been cast in all of show business. And the favorite was, for a while, Burt Reynolds. I'd seen a, a TV show, and I thought the, the guy was terrific, had all the, all the right elements for Bond. Cubby had a thing about Bond being over six feet. He wanted Bond to be tall. And the second and most important thing was, he said, you can't do Bond and not have him be British. It's absolutely ridiculous. It would be like casting an Englishman in a John Wayne part in a Western. It doesn't work. While the producers search for a new 007, they must also develop a Bond story for the new generation of moviegoers. Cubby said to me, here are several books. Which one would you like to do? I wanted to do Live and Let Die because I thought it had more of an edge to it because all the villains were black, and I knew it was a very chancy thing because we were uh, making it in the time of the Black Panthers, we were making it in the time of uh, really a black revolution. While Tom Mankiewicz transforms Ian Fleming's most controversial novel into a screenplay, Guy Hamilton begins looking for locations. Tom knew that I was a jazz buff, and he said, you'd love New Orleans. And I said, oh, come on, Tom, you know, we're not going to do the Mardi Gras because Terence Young has done that with the Jung Canoe. What else is in New Orleans? Oh, there are jazz funerals. <laughs> in about five minutes flat, we conned up that sequence. Whose uh, funeral is it? Yours. <laughs> But I knew that Mr. Broccoli and Mr. Saltzman were not going to send a large unit to New Orleans just to shoot four minutes screen time. What else is in New Orleans, Tom? The canals, the levees. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, we could do a chase. And that's how the New Orleans uh, sequence built up. There was a wonderful collaborative way that bonds were put together. Guy had ideas. Harry had a million ideas. Cubby had some ideas. I'd wandered around the Caribbean, found absolutely nothing of any interest. But then on location scouting, driving by, there suddenly was this sign by the side of the road in huge letters, and it said, trespassers will be eaten. And everybody stopped, and it was this crocodile farm. The name of the fellow who ran the crocodile farm was Ross Kananga. This absolutely marvelous man, a complete lunatic. And I named the villain after him. With the story coming together, producers need one final element, James Bond. And I did say to Sean, it's got crocodiles, it's got a boat chase, it's got... Um, and I was trying to kind of just see if I could tweak his interest. And he said to me, there's only two things I've ever wanted to own in my life a golf course and my own bank. He said, and I have the golf course and I'm well on the way to the bank. I'm not coming back. I had met Covey and Harry because we used to gamble and went to the Curzon House Club. And so I would sit across from the table with these two big spenders. And eventually, you know, we became friends. And then one day Harry called me and he said, well, Covey, Covey and I would like you to do the next one. They came up with Roger Moore. It seemed like a good idea. He's attractive, he was debonair. Sean's personality comes through very strongly in all the bonds he made. And my personality is entirely different. So I sort of read a couple of books, and one of them, it said that Bond had returned from a mission somewhere. He had killed, but he didn't like killing. Sean could sit at a table with a beautiful girl, and you had the option as a writer of either, either having him lean over and kiss her or stick a knife in her Roger could kiss the girl, but if he stuck the knife in her, he would look nasty. So that was the way I played it. Somebody really didn't like doing it. You don't understand, see? They'll kill me if I do. And I'll kill you if you don't. You got the feeling of, of the English gentleman more out of Roger than you got out of uh, Sean. 
On the other hand, Roger, and that's why the humor may be increased in Live and Let Die, could play a quip very well. I'm going to be completely useless to you. Oh, sure we'd be able to lick you into shape. Roger knew his way around a sophisticated comedy scene very well. So you could do things with Roger, right? You wrote for Roger differently. But for the new 007, comparisons are bound to be made. He was throwing some pretty big shoes. The only thing that worried me was how could I say my name is Bond, James Bond, without saying my name is Bond, James Bond. Uh, that was the one thing I had, had a couple of nightmares about. I remember him saying about the logo that was still obviously John Connery's image. He says, when are we going to change the logos there? We tried in various ways um, not to imitate Sean where we didn't have to. Guy said, I think we should avoid any direct comparisons by you not saying the things that Sean said. A martini, shaken, not stirred. Bourbon noise, please. If it isn't enough that Roger Moore has to worry about the shadow of Sean Connery, he also has to avoid imitating another 60s icon, Simon Templer. The first issue was that they were making sure that he never raised his eyebrow as he had done in The Saint, because that was like a famous mannerism of his. I mean, we've all done the Bond pictures, we all know each other, and for a newcomer to come in, uh, it's a very daunting experience. Guy Hamilton, I think, was more worried about me taking over uh, Bond uh, than I was. And Roger took it very well indeed. My name's Bond. James Bond. I know he made it his, because he is a sophisticated man, so he made it his, James Bond. Absolutely. There's no sense in going off half-cocked. Even before much of the cast is signed, filmmakers begin to work on one of the most ambitious action sequences ever produced. Until we almost started shooting, it just said, scene 156, the most terrific boat chase you've ever seen, because I never got around to writing it, until Harry and uh, David Picker and other people said, where is this terrific boat chase? Of course, when we got there, there was a slight problem, because uh, all the bayous now were kind of heavily overgrown with reeds, and you couldn't really see them. We whistled up a helicopter. And we started uh, flying around. We got to the beautiful house that's in the boat chase where there's a wedding on the little point, and the boats go across the point. And we both said, oh, this is great. And I remember we landed in this kind of backyard, as you call them in America, and uh, a lady came out. They decided that the point on which we lived was just right for a boat to leap across. And the first we realized was when a helicopter landed on our front lawn to the great delight of the children. She said, boys, boys, boys. We could see children in the background looking, you see, and she said, you know, may I help you? So I said, yeah, we're, you know, scouted for James Bond. The director came and asked if we would mind if they used our property. Of course, we were thrilled to death. It sounded like the most exciting thing that's happened on the bayou in a long time. I'd never, ever seen Southern Hospitality. These people were just amazing. Finding the location for the amazing boat stunts is only half the challenge. They'd spoken to some people called the Stingers. I think they were in the Everglades somewhere. One of those places, you know, and these boats kind of went up a 45 degree ramp, you know, and kind of jumped about four feet, something like that. But we wanted, we wanted, had to do a jump of at least about 80, 85 feet. And we've had a number of uh, problems, let's say, in getting boats to go as far as we had to go. Stuntman Jerry Camo is determined to make the boat jumps work. We found that Jerry, when he actually hit the ramp, he'd got to put the motor in tilt just at that moment when it hit. On October the 16th, 1972, Guy Hamilton calls action, and stuntman Jerry Camo races his Glastron speedboat at 75 miles per hour toward the specially built ramp. We did hold the world record for boat jumps, and I think that particular day, Jerry jumped 115 feet. And the whole thing, one take, and that's it. But all the hard work being done pre-production. On the second jump, which is definitely a slower boat, and it's one of the baddie boats, we came over the cars and we landed in the water, but we had difficulty because they had the boat that Bond was in going on, which created a wake, and that wake uh, 
while my boat landed on it, carried it off into another direction, and of course uh, we turned over and ended up off in the weeds. Stuntmen are not the only ones who need expert boating skills. We did have one or two accidents during the preparation. The problem with jet boats is that if your engine should cut for some unknown reason, you can't steer the boat. We came around a bend, and the boat was on its sort of tilted at an angle, and obviously the gas tank wasn't full. And so the engine cut up, and I got hit, bang. And I flew into the back of the boat, and I came out of that with what I thought was losing my teeth, and with a leg that wouldn't move. This was the, f first, the day before we started shooting, when we were rehearsing. Meanwhile, the producers set the rest of the cast, including the challenging part of Bond's leading lady, Solitaire. I originally wanted Diana Ross. I thought it would be, and, and I thought it would be in a very positive way, barrier breaking. The producers decide to stick with Ian Fleming's original conception of the character as a white woman and start scouting for an actress who can capture the sensuality of a Bond woman and the virginal innocence of the character. I was doing a series called The Aneedon Line, and my agent, John Redway, called me and said they wanted to meet me for the Bond film. I remember when I came in, Harry said, take off your coat. So I took off my coat, take off your hat. He sort of barked and I took off this fur hat and of course down came all my hair tumbling down. And that was it. He said, we want you to play the lead in the James Bond film. And I went, what? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing the Aneedon line. And he said, you know, never mind. He said, I want you to come and meet my partner. I was on the street uh, doing across 110th Street. And David Picker, I believe he was then vice president of the United Artists came up to me in the street and said, what are you doing directly after you do the film? So I said, probably going home. He says, I wouldn't count on it. I think you better get ready to go to England to, to, for a living life die. So um, I'm sitting there, um, and um, Harry Salzman says, he looks at me. We, we, we exchange some conversation. All I can remember is maybe a couple of minutes went by, and then he said, uh, Madam, how soon can you get on a plane to go to New Orleans? I said, as an actor always says, anytime. You never refuse. <laughs> he says, well, we'll have you in a plane in about two hours. I got a call to go to a hotel, I think it was the Algonquin in New York City, I'm not quite sure. And who do I meet but Guy Hamilton? And he said to me, what kind of weapon would you like to have? I knew right then and there I had it. And I'd say, well, you know, you've used so many guns and many knives. Give me something unusual like a hook. For many black actors, the film proves to be a great showcase, though they are mainly cast as villains. It's a Bond movie, so you know Bond is going to win. If the villain is black, you know he's going to lose because the villain is going to lose. So along the way, I thought, maybe we can have some, some other people to make fun of. Dobe. I got me a regular Ben-Hur down here. That kind of dialogue you can't miss, you know. <laughs> what are you? Some kind of doomsday machine boy? The best dialogue writer I've ever, ever seen. Now, Clifton James, who came from New York and doesn't remotely have a southern accent, came down and he had a wonderful gut, you know. I wore padding. I wore an umpire suit because they're all very proud of their stomachs, you know. With the cast in place, shooting begins in earnest along the Louisiana bayous. Quiet everywhere, please. The first sequence that I watched was the stunt sequence where the boat, um, the two boats came across the bayous and went right through the wedding party and then down the other side. One boat and one boat only comes up the lawn. There is another one that goes Don't round there. Crowd, it doesn't the really matter I'll which one you coming. look at, Don't including crowd. both. This end is very safe. We have tested it. It is sometimes interesting, and I think you might enjoy that. What happens down that end? First stuntman got into the boat and he's kind of zooming around. And suddenly there's a most enormous crash. The guy crashed into this tree. They called in the paramedics. I'm okay. I'm okay. Let me down. Okay. So now we're now going to try and do the stunt again. 
and uh, action. Up comes the boat, straight over, right through the wedding. And I said, I bet it's going to hit that tree. Hit it fair and square, I can't tell you. Tore another big hole in the side. Well, in all the practice runs, the boat's always gone off to the left. They hit that tree just dead center. I mean, the boat went absolutely perfectly straight all the way across that line, which it never has done before. Everybody's now very worried, and Guy Hamilton said, I don't think we should do any more, you know. Not today. We'll try tomorrow. But the filming cannot continue with the wedding scene. The bayou's flooded. Everything's underwater. All the chairs are, are floating. For the director and the producers, setbacks seem to be a daily occurrence. There was a cold wind blowing, and I could feel this ache, and I went into my Winnebago, and I lay down, my knees came up to my chin, and Derek Cracknell, the first assistant, came in and said, Rog, when you could call court, he said, I better call a doctor. With the film's star in the hospital with kidney stones and accidents mounting, members of the crew worry that the film is under some kind of voodoo curse. <laughs> As the production crew copes with setbacks, some of the cast explore the power of the tarot. I knew nothing about tarot, and so I went to Bourbon Street, where they had tarot card readers, and I took all my rings and wedding rings and anything off that would give any clues away. And the tarot card reader <laughs> looked me in the eyes and in the cards and basically told me I was going to be married three times. So since I'd only just got married for the first time, this was a little bit of a shock, you can imagine. <laughs> I, and uh, I, I have to admit that it did affect some of my decisions later on in life. On November the 12th, 1972, the production crew flies from New Orleans to the exotic north shore of Jamaica with over two tons of film equipment. Oh, it was very exotic. It was absolutely amazing. I've never seen anywhere so beautiful in my whole life as this hotel called the Saint Souci. It was wonderful. I spent a every morning swimming in that pool, meeting Roger, every morning before we went to work. Well, I must say, it's fantastic to be in Jamaica in the winter. I mean, the sun, when it's so cold and foggy in London. And to be playing a part in a James Bond film, which demands all that action, is something I'm not used to at all. And the service. We had, um, we had uh, housekeepers, cooks, and maids who would knock on your door and say, Madam, what would you like to have for breakfast this morning? And I just remember the, the music and the, the warmth and the, you know, the beautiful beaches. It was just so exotic and, and glorious. But the voodoo curse from Louisiana seems to follow the film crew to Jamaica. There was this uh, voodoo witch doctor who would give me a reading. <laughs> they were going to film it. I don't know what, don't know what happened to that film, but... Uh... What is gathering? Hallelujah. Mr. Moore, I'm about to start what is known as a psychic reading for you. Is that OK, sir? It's fine with me. Yeah. I hope it is afterwards. Tarot cards were being turned over and said that uh, I was going to have a son. You are going to have a son, sir. Uh, there is going to be a son in your life. Well, apparently, he was conceived there. So I don't know whether the witch doctor had anything to do with <laughs> it. And I think you were born to be what is termed a uh, humanitarian. You would become one of uh, our great Buddha. Finally, I found something in life that's a little more important than thinking of yourself. Not a little more important, a lot more important. On November the 30th, 1972, filmmakers begin shooting one of the movie's signature sequences. We bought a London bus, very, very cheap. We actually took a bus driver who was one of the principal instructors at London Passenger Transport. And they said, well, what we actually want you to do is to skid a bus round on a 30-foot road. You feel for the first time you're doing that it's going to tip, tip over, but they don't tip over. And I, of course, was involved in some of the stunts myself, which, in retrospect, was kind of foolish. I was in that bus when it spun around, and, you know, it could have been anyone. She was on the bus every time I skidded it. When I was in the back of that bus, I just was dying. And then we had all these motorcycles coming, cars zooming into the uh, sugar cane, zooming into the sea. 
where we had to put a ramp into the uh, on the kind of the parapet into the sea. I remember um, we had to move all this coral, and of course it went slightly awry, and of course the poor fellow landed into the coral that we hadn't cleared because he hadn't hit the uh, the right spot. We only did it once, so it wasn't a question of redoing it. The stuntman is not badly hurt, but the sequence is hardly over yet. And to finish the sequence... What can we do with that? Oh, I know, knock the top off because there's a low bridge. Oh, I got a bit sceptical about that one because I've never actually seen a bus go under a bridge and take the roof completely off. It generally stops halfway. I said, you know, have they done this before? And they said, no. When it all set up, we went up about three or 400 yards up the road. And I said, well, how do they know it's going to work? And they said, they don't. And they told me roughly what speed it would take, about 40 mile an hour. And I remember my heart was pumping. And they just said, action, and away we went. And then, of course, I felt very proud to have been in that bus. Filming continues off the roads and into the swamps. Ross Kanag was the name of the man in real life who owned this crocodile farm. Had an interesting backstory. Ross Kanag, from what I understand, was a Seminole Indian. His father was uh, put on an alligator show, crop show, and Ross, as a kid, he used to put his head in the uh, mouth of the alligator. And one day, the junk, uh, and he was in there for 20 minutes before um, the crop relaxed and let him out. And he had seen his father be eaten alive by crocodiles. Ross knew which ones. He says, that one got my dad. And decided to take over the family business. So they had 1,500 of these creatures. Ross Kananga, at one time, had a lion pet lion that used to patrol the place, and they got to the lion. These things are really lethal, and alligators and crocodiles. And then they stuck me on this island, a uh, little tiny island. This was a major production number because all the crocs had to be taken out. And they, and they had these fake crocodiles there, and they were made of foam rubber, and they looked pretty real. And I was stuck on there while Tihi uh, throws out bits of chicken to attract the alligators. They were shooting the sequence, and this mechanical arm is very hard to work. I'm messing with this hook, trying to get it to work right. And I dropped a piece, couple of pieces on the, the side there. I thought it was a rather smart idea when we were doing wardrobe before we started the film. I said, well, why didn't, why didn't I have crocodile shoes? <laughs> Do you think this is a good idea, okay? Uh, I think it's a beautiful idea. And all of a sudden, one of the fake crocodiles starts moving straight for Roger and Julius. Nasty BDI is going like this. And this thing is coming straight for Roger. Well, gun shots went off. Ross Kananga himself threw himself in. Once they see some white flesh uh, and they're swimming, they can leap 20, 30 feet. Everyone went crazy. What a mistake. I had the skin of one of their cousins. Uh, they were out to get me. After a few last-minute shots, the first unit departs for London on December the 19th and resumes shooting at Pinewood Studios, where more creatures are required. I think the gentleman who was tied up to the post didn't like snakes. And the snake is going there, and he's looking at the snake, and they said, right, OK, cut. OK, you can relax now. And he had fainted. So I had just been told this story, and now I come in to do a scene with a snake. The man who was holding the snake in my sequence was a dancer, and he wasn't real happy about holding a, the real snake either. But by the second or third day, you know, he was feeling a little more comfortable, and between takes, he put the snake in the other hand, of course, the snake turned around and bit him. Well, this guy screamed, dropped the snake, you know, ah, you know, went running out of the place. Everyone went running after him to make sure that he was OK because he'd been bitten by the snake, and the snake was coming straight for me. And I'm tied up at the snake. Nobody cares about me, but this snake's coming right for me. I was terrified. And at the last second, the snake handler picked up the snake when it was can only have been inches from my feet, and I really thought this was it. <laughs> I had a, a very special rapport with uh, Jeffrey Holder. Really nice guy big, enormous, with uh, a quite understandable fear of snakes. Jeffrey had to do the thing where he falls backwards into the snakes. And Guy knew that he wasn't going to do this. And I saw the real, the real coffin with the real snakes. I've never seen so many snakes in my life. It was really scary. But we were very fortunate that Princess Alexandra came to, to visit the set that day. They knew that Jeffrey, being such a gentleman and such a consummate professional, would not refuse to do that scene. 
if the royal family were watching him. And so when they said turnover action, he went backwards. He didn't stay there long, but he went backwards. While the first unit finishes up work at Pinewood Studios and on location in New York, one last second unit stunt has to be filmed in Jamaica. Kananga was the only man who would try the stunt. You did something you couldn't have paid me a million dollars to do. It had taken writer Tom Mankiewicz only moments to type the words, but it takes Ross Kananga weeks of preparation to create the stunt. We got the crocodiles tied down by their little legs. Ross Kananga dons Roger Moore's outfit for the scene, including the slick heel dress shoes. We now present all five of Ross Kananga's attempts at the death-defying stunt. As he's about to jump, the crocodiles all do this because they're saying, here comes that guy again. Uh, I mean, they, they'd seen the act twice, and so they're waiting for him to jump again. Finally, on the afternoon of December the 31st, Ross Kananga defies death for a fifth time. On July the 5th, 1973, Live and Let Die premieres at London's Leicester Square Odeon. When record-breaking box office receipts come in, it proves that no voodoo curse can stand up to James Bond's magic. In the end, filmmakers pull off the biggest feat of all. They give the world a new 007.